Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on International Human Rights Day and the third roundtable conference on human rights. I'm Kijavi Kolushe. I will be your chairperson for today's webinar. I've been asked specifically by my professor, Dr. Vijaya, to keep this session as casual as possible. So I'll try my best to remove all, for all formalities and I hope everyone's comfortable. Before I highlight the order of this program, allow me to read out the concept. To quote Eleanor Roosevelt herself, where after all do universal human rights begin? In small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere without concerted citizen action to uphold them close to them. We shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. Human rights are rights which are inherent and inalienable to all human beings, regardless of race, sex, nationality, ethnicity, language, religion, or any other. These rights include civil, political, economic, and cultural rights. Everyone is entitled to these rights without discrimination. It is obligatory for the governments to promote and protect human rights. Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a milestone in history of humankind. It was proclaimed by the UN General Assembly on December 10th, 1948, Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady of USA, played a crucial role as chairperson of the drafting committee. There are other women who have shaped this document. Hansa Mehta from India, the only other female delegate to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights between 1947 and 1948, was a staunch fighter for women's rights in India and abroad. She is instrumental in changing the phrase, all men are born free and equal, to all human beings are born free and equal, in Article 1 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. This day is observed as International Human Rights Day. The United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, together with International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and International Covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights are known as International Bill of Human Rights. In its 72 years of existence, there are many cases of human rights protection and violations. In this regard, we will discuss the role of human rights enforcing agencies in mitigating issues relating to sustainable development goals, racism, pandemics, protection of minorities, climate change, and etc. The order of today's program is as follows. Dr. Rime will be giving out the welcome address, followed by a keynote address by Mr. P. Anthony Raj, one of our esteemed guests. Later, we will proceed with the student roundtable discussion. Our very own Dr. Vijaya will be the moderator, and the speakers are as follows. Mr. Putionen Jamir, Ms. Mfe Wang, Ms. Ningning Nyumai, Mr. Hotoka Shohe, Mr. Botuvi Chishi. They will all be speaking on the multiple topics of their own. We also have special invitees, two of our reputable guests, Major General N. George. He is the director of Vanguard Business School at uh, Bangalore, Karnataka. And Mr. M. Brame. He is a visiting, visiting faculty of sociology of B.S. Abdur Rahman Krishan Institute of Science and Technology, Tamil. Thank both of them for coming and attending our webinar. Later, we will have a question and answer session, after which Mr. Kukrusetu will be giving the concluding. So to put things into motion, um, Dr. Rime, you're free to begin your address. Thank you, Chairperson. Good afternoon, everyone. Honorable Director, Dean HOD, 
fellow teachers, our special invitees, retired Major General N. George, Director Bangar Business School, Bangalore, Karnataka, Mr. P. Anthony Raj, Assistant Professor, Department of Rural Development Science, Arul Anandar College, Madurai, Tamil Nadu, who is also our keynote speaker, Mr. M. Prem, Visiting Faculty of Sociology, B.S. Abdul Rahman Crescent Institute of Science and Technology, Chennai, Tamil Nadu. Our student speakers, all the participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm indeed very happy to be able to welcome you all to this department third roundtable conference on human rights under the theme Universal Human Rights Theory and Practice on this glorious occasion. Wishing you all a very happy Human Rights Day in the first place. On this glorious occasion, our department thinks fit to do something to mark the observance of Human Rights Day and also to support this year's theme, Recover Better, Stand Up for Human Rights. The idea or concept of the Roundtable Conference was mooted in the year 2018 and soon after that, the Department of Political Science Tetsu College decided to organize the Roundtable Conference on relevant emerging issues every year. In 2018, the first Roundtable Conference on Religious Intolerance and Extremism in India was held. In 2019, the second Roundtable Conference on Emerging Issues in Indian Politics post-2014 general elections was held. As I mentioned earlier, this year's Roundtable Conference on this glorious occasion will remind us all about the evolution, meaning and nature of human rights, contemporary significance of human rights, international bill of human rights, uh, classifications of human rights, human rights issues and activities taken up by the human rights human rights commissions, bodies, and civil society organization in the field of human rights for the protection of human rights around the world, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm looking forward to a very engaging conference session with, session with the student speaker and with our special invitees today. I once again welcome you all to this great academic event and give my best wishes to all the participants who will be sharing their knowledge on different aspects of human rights and human rights issues. Let us all recover better and stand up for human rights. We all need to have a proper human rights culture, even in our society. And for this, we need human rights defenders and educators for the present and future generation. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. I'd uh, like to invite our guest speaker, Mr. Anthony, to please present his keynote address. Sir, the time is yours. Mr. Anthony Raj, um, please step forward for your keynote address.
Uh, I would like to uh, request the IT team or IT team to kindly see to the uh, blocking of some audios for some speaker. Okay, sir. Uh, uh, sorry, there is a problem. Uh, he couldn't connect. Uh, through his audio is not working. So just uh, he needs a few moments. On behalf of the organizing team, I really apologize uh, for the technical issue. We are working on it. Uh, kindly do bear with us. Thank you. Hello, hello. Yeah, we can hear uh, hello, you. Hello, sir. Uh, Vijaya, can you? Yeah, I can. I can hear you. You are audible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry for the interruption, sir. Uh, network connections. Uh, I'm sorry for the interruption again. Uh, so moreover, I I'm sorry also for not coming through uh, camera. Uh, so uh, so very uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm uh, especially uh, chief coordinator of this roundtable conference. Dr. Longmai, the coordinator, Dr. Vijaya, and the special invitees to this third roundtable conference, uh, Major retired Major General George and Mr. Prem, and the other student speakers and faculties and students of this college. Um, once again, a warm good afternoon. So I am uh, I am very grateful to your college for giving this opportunity on this Human Rights Day. So it is a right occasion to have this roundtable conference on human rights themes, especially uh, we are, uh, the theme of the conference is especially theory and practice. So here, uh, the, my talk uh, will be having the three uh, portions. The first, I will be discussing on uh, some introductory note on human rights. The second part, I will be discussing about uh, some of the human rights issues. Uh, which is happening in India, and thirdly, I'll be uh, I'll be taking one case uh, that is uh, the impact of farm bills and the recent protest which is going on in Delhi. 
against these recent farm acts and how we could analyze what are the human rights issues associated with these farm uh, acts. Uh, then finally, I'll be concluding. So uh, this is what uh, this is the part of my presentation. So to begin with, so uh, so we might be knowing. Uh, so first, we should know about. Already, you might be knowing that what is human rights. So I will try to give some of the. I will try to contextualize on which context uh, the concept of human rights has emerged. So mostly. Uh, it was uh, human rights, the concept of human rights was emerged in the uh, after the Second World War. So mostly uh, in the 1945, uh, United Nations organization was established to bring out peace and security to the global world. And uh, so in 1948, the human rights declaration was adopted. So uh, on the day of December 10th. So that's why from 1950s onwards, we are celebrating a uh, Human Rights Day uh, on December 10th. So it was the day when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights were adopted. So what do you mean by human rights? So basically, uh, it is a fundamental and basic rights and privileges of all human beings, uh, irrespective of gender, caste, race, and any other identity altogether. So, uh, because we have, we are entitled to these rights because we are existing as human beings. So, uh, it is mostly universal in nature. Universal in the sense, it is up, it applies to all nations and all communities. So, it cannot be taken away in any way. It is also most of the human rights are interrelated with each other. So we cannot, uh, uh, what I can say, so we, it is not indivisible. Okay, so all human rights are interrelated with, uh, with each other, especially uh, suppose if some communities are politically emerged or if they got some political rights through these political rights, they can gain other social and economic rights. So I can give you, I can explain this through an example. So uh, during 1970s, after the Green Revolution, uh, there was an emergence of uh, backward caste movement in Northern India, uh, especially in Uttar Pradesh, Samajwadi Party, that is regional, one of the regional party. The other one is Rastriya Janadadal Party, which is a fair, which is a big party in Bihar. So through this, the regional local parties were gained momentum after 1970s. So they got the political power, especially the backward caste. So through this political power, they, uh, they got other economic rights and other social rights. So all we can, uh, we can say that all human rights are interrelated with one another. We cannot uh, say that only if you if you get only these uh, rights, we could get everything. So we need to get all forms of rights. So uh, this is what regarding uh, human rights. So now I'll go to the what are the some of the human rights issues of in in Indian context. So especially I like to discuss about the three form bills or acts which was recently introduced in Parliament. So now uh, you might see, uh, you might have uh, daily, you might have seen in newspapers and media, uh, this issue is mostly uh, given more priority because uh, in the history, so lakhs of farmers are gathered in one place. Uh, this is the first time. So you might have seen in all media channels and everything. So why they are protesting against? So mostly they are protesting against these three form acts. So the, uh, the consequences or probable impact of these three acts will have more human rights issues. So this is what I'd like to uh, discuss, how to analyze this issue from human rights perspective. Uh, especially, uh, there are three acts. The first one is Farm Produce Trade and Commerce Act. Uh, the second act is Farmers Agreement on 
Price Assurance and Farm Services Act. The third one is Essential Commodities Amendment Act. So these are the three acts which was recently introduced in Parliament. Uh, especially uh, though these acts have some positive impact, so most of the scholars and uh, they they hold the opinion that this may have disastrous effect in future. So I will try to analyze this issue from human rights perspective. The first one is Essential Commodities Act. So according to the Essential Commodities Act, earlier uh, it was the convention that uh, the central government, they listed some of the commodities as essential commodities, especially our daily usage like vegetables, then edible oil, then other eatable items, then tomato, onion, whatever it is. So what, whatever we are using as daily purpose, there are some essential commodities. So the, the, the objective of including some eatable items or edible items in uh, essential commodities was that the price, whenever uh, the uh, price rise was, uh, whenever the essential commodities, the price is rising for essential commodities, it is a responsibility of the state government and central government to reduce the price. That was the motive behind the essential act. But now uh, they have removed certain items from the essential commodities. So what was the impact? The main, main, the main impact was that uh, because anyone can store or anyone can hold these items in their storage in their storage so it will create artificial demand so whenever the artificial demand is created for these essential items the price of this price of those essential commodities will go up there the state government and central government should act but here when they remove certain edible items from these essential commodities it mostly favor those corporates, especially all the, the price rise will go, the price will go up, mostly the all consumers, especially poor farmers and peasants and consumers will be affected. The large chunk of profit will go to the corporates and intermediaries. Uh, especially you might have seen that onion, onion prices. So in the, uh, in the summer days, uh, they will buy 20, 20 rupees per kg. The intermediaries will get from the farmers. Then they will store it in a particular place. During monsoon, monsoon season, the demand will go up. So what what they will what what they will do is that so they won't take out whatever they stored in their own places. So mostly they will create artificial demand. So through this artificial demand, the price will go up. Whenever the price will go up slowly, they will start selling their selling their store products in a higher price. So here it is the uh, how we can look at this issue. So whenever the price rise is going up, it is against the right to food. Right to we have a lot of consumer rights. So it is a responsibility of the state government to provide the essential commodities in a cheaper price. But here instead of state deciding it's the prices of essential commodities the market will decide the prices of essential commodities so mostly uh, the commodity price will be going up so it is the right uh, uh, mostly some of the rights here will have some problem so mostly it is against the right to food then against the consumer rights and against right to livelihood opportunities mostly poor will be affected then uh, they are talking about the corporate farming so this is the concept i uh, emerged after the uh, introduction of and the corporate farming was emerged the concept of emerge according to the corporate farming uh, mostly uh, the corporates will enter into agreement with the farmers 
So mostly uh, they will enter into agreement with the farmers. Here there will be agreement. Uh, what is the price? So in what price in which uh, are the corporates going to get for their produce? Okay. Uh, mostly uh, the corporate farming in the sense they will uh, have agreement with most of a large uh, more number of farmers especially thousands of farmers or more than thousands of farmers the large tract of land will under, will be in the agreement the price of the price of this commodities also will be mentioned in the how many years uh, this uh, the particular farmer should sell the sell their produce to the corporates so everything will be mentioned in the agreement okay but what was the consequence if the, some of the farmers will be going for this agreement it will have some disastrous consequences especially um, farmers don't have their bargaining power if they if if have if they found some if they find some issues with corporates uh, suppose earlier uh, in our tamil nadu and all uh, especially the sugarcane farmers will have some agreement with the uh, sugar mill sugar mills okay so uh, they will sell their sugar can but they will get the amount only after 6 months or after one year only so this was the problem associated with corporate farming so if they once they don't have bargaining power it will be in favor of corporates and also uh, suppose uh, the quality of uh, tomato is very less if the corporates may after the produce suppose they after the agreement uh, the farmers are producing some kind of tomatoes or onions okay they now they are going to sell it to the corporates so there there is a possibility that they may get those uh, produce for less prices telling that uh, this these are the uh, these onions and these tomatoes have very less quality okay so they they will give innumerable reasons for that so suppose uh, in the agreement it was mentioned that 50 rupee per onion okay so after uh, so after they uh, when they are telling that this onion has less quality then they will buy it only for 20 rupee so 30 rupee will be less so for kg if they are losing 30 rupee if it is hundreds and uh, tons they may have lot of uh, losses so they will enter into debt then most of the farmers will be in debt because they won't get whatever the minimum price also so it will uh, it will also lead to uh, suicide also so here we could consider the farmer suicide it is not an individual act it is a social forces which will have which will which make the farmers to commit suicide so this corporate farming if it is implemented it goes against the right to food choices and right to cultural rights you will lose your right to cultural rights suppose most of the corporates will be uh, interested in producing the products which has more value in international markets okay so uh, suppose rice is the uh, rice is the stable food of southern india and wheat is the stable food of northern india suppose they have, they feel that uh, corn has the more value than rice in the international market so if the, if the uh, all the lands are going under the control of corporates then they will cultivate only corn the production of rice will go down the production of wheat also will go down then we have to consume whatever whatever they are produced by the corporates so here we are losing our right to food choice they will decide what we need to eat they will decide what items we need to purchase so here we lost our cultural rights so then uh, then one uh, another problem with this corporate farming was that so already i told you that only the corporate farming corporates will have more power than the farmers farmers won't have more bargaining power also if it is the issue is going to the court corporates will have more power so uh, farmers will enter into debt then it will debt will increasing over the period of time and finally 
the car the farmers will sell the land to the corporates so in like this way most of the most of the lands will come under the corporate control so if that is going to happen so this is what the prospects prospects of those farm rights if it is going to happen the common people will have more problem especially there won't be any consumer rights there won't be any right to life there won't be any equal there won't, you don't you lost your right to food choice everything will be decided by the market everything will be decided by the market so another one is a minimum support price now the system is that is um minimum support price will be decided by the central government okay for most of the products especially cotton sugar can uh, all those items so now in this act what they are telling is that farmers can sell anywhere suppose uh, then mostly the, now the farmers are selling their produce through agricultural produce market committee it is established in every state so there minimum support price is fixed by the state government and central government so now here the now the present act what they are what they are telling is that interstate buying of food, buying of agricultural pro, agricultural produce is accepted so what it leads to was that most of the corporates will buy those product and they will store it in a particular place it they will create the uh, what i can say artificial demand for the particular product then here the uh, slowly the agricultural produce market committee also will slowly vanished then farmers will not get their minimum support price also everything will be decided by the market and corporates so in the same way uh, agricultural farmers will enter into debt then so many problems associated with debt and everything will be farmers will lose their life it will enter into agrarian crisis so uh, this is what we have to look at the particular problem from human rights perspective here i would like to say that what is the role of student to look at each and every issue which is happening around you first of all you need to problematize this issue from various perspectives and relate those i list out those problems associated with particular issues suppose the farm bills or any other human rights issue problematize the issue first then connect those issues with ideals and values of democracy or human rights especially equality social justice equal opportunities freedom liberty these are the ideals of democracy as well as human rights so then you relate all those concept with the problems then you will be aware of or you will be conscious of what are the impact of those social issue how it is mostly related to this human rights so with this i'll end this keynote address thank you thank you all that has been most educational mr anthony thank you very much i think it's time we proceed to the student roundtable discussion now so um handing it over to you dr vijaya take it away uh thank you mr roshi uh and good afternoon everyone i, I am honored to chair the session on human rights and the to the session has speakers uh, young minds students so i thank uh and i want to express my gratitude to head, uh, head of uh, the department of political science dr rime for giving me this opportunity uh, so before go, moving to the speakers i just uh, want to give a few uh, i want to say a few lines about human rights uh, actually our keynote address he has uh, he has addressed uh, the about the evolution of human rights and we know that rights are part uh, uh, part of every human being and uh, these rights are uh, inalienable and this include uh civil rights political rights economic and cultural rights so uh, uh these rights an individual he or she 
inherits these uh, uh, rights right right from his uh, his or her birth and uh, these rights they must uh, know and they must have these rights uh, until they die so let us see today uh, we have this uh, round table discussion and uh, they are going to touch many topics actually they uh, to discuss about uh, human right violations and first we have the uh, speakers speaking on uh, interface between international human rights law and international humanitarian law so i would like to invite mr jamir ba fifth semester student to speak on interface between international human rights law and international humanitarian law okay. <coughs> thank you so much good afternoon to everyone i'm Ms. i'm pution jamir a third year student pursuing ba in political science tetso college my topic titled Interface Between International Human Rights Law and International Humanitarian Law, which is very close to my heart. Fortunately, I'm also studying human rights as a subject un under Dr. Anuradha Babur. We have to understand that international humanitarian law and international human rights law are two distinct but complementary bodies of law. They are put they are both concerned with the protections of life, health, and dignity. However, there is a thin, there is a thin line drawn between these two that's separate for, from the comprehending as an interchangeable term. International humanitarian law applies in armed conflict, while human rights law ap applies at all time in peace and in war. Both in international humanitarian law and human rights law apply in armed conflicts. The main difference in their application is that international hum human rights law allows a state to suspend a number of human rights if it faces a situation of emergency. International humanitarian law cannot be susp suspended except as a pro as provided in Article 5 to the Fourth Geneva Convention. However, a state cannot suspend or waive certain fundamental rights that must be respected in all circumstances. That this includes the right to live, the prohibition of tortures and inhuman punishment or treatment the outlawing of slavery or servitude, the principle of legality and non radioactivity of the law and the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. State have a legal duty to respect and implement both IHL and human rights law. Complaints with IHL require a state to introduce internet introduce national legislation to implement its obligation to train its military and to bring to try those in the grave pitch of such law human rights law also contain provisions require a state to be take, to be take legislative legislative and others appropriate measures to implement its rule and punish violation i shall based on the Geneva and Hague Convention. Additionally, protocol and a series of treaties governing means and method of waging war, such as those spanning blending leisure weapon, landmines and chemical and biological weapon, as well as customary law. International human rights law is more complex, unlike IHL includes regional treaties. The main global legal instrument is the Universal Declarations of Human Rights adopted by, adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1948. Other global treaties include the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, as well as treaties 
on the prevention and punishment of torture and other form of cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, on the elimination eliminations of racial discrimination and discrimination against women or on the rights of the child. Regional human rights conventions or charter have been adopted in Europe, the Americas, Africa, and the Arab region. In situations of armed conflict, human rights law complements on and reinforce the protection afforded by international humanitarian law. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jami. Uh, he has uh, given us a clear distinction uh, of international humanitarian law and international human rights law and how they both are complementary and uh, what are the uh, their jurisdictions. And he has uh, uh, explained to us what uh, the different forms of human rights violations and which are covered under these specific laws. So uh, our next speaker, uh, Fionn Konyak, she is going to uh, speak about human rights violations in the context of race and ethnicity and this, uh, let us see, it's very interesting because we have seen that in the most uh, developed, advanced democracies of the world, they are facing these issues, the racist and ethnicity uh, issues. And uh, the world's largest democracy, uh, even India, we are facing these uh, issues. And let us see what the speaker has to put forward. Uh, Ms. Pion, please take, uh, take your place. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, respected chairperson, special invitees, professors, and all my dear friends. My name is Anne Fiwang Konyak. I am from first semester MA Political Science. On this day, 10th of December 2020, as we celebrate Human Rights Day, I would like to talk on human rights violation in the context of the race and ethnicity. Uh, racism is one force that many nations have been combating where United Nations has been playing a great role under different policies. Following the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the year 1948, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, that is ICERD, was the major international agreement on human rights adopted by the UN General Assembly. However, the battle continues. The recent happenings uh, during this pandemic has cornered the topic of racism and elevated at another level. And we are all very aware with this incident uh, that happened on May 25th, 2020, when the many police, police officers arrested George Floyd, a 46-year-old black man. I think I shouldn't be mentioning this black, but a 46-year-old man after a convenience store employee called 911 and told the police that Mr. Floyd had bought cigarettes with a counterfeit $20 bill. But unfortunately, 17 minutes after the first squad car arrived at the scene, Mr. Floyd was unconscious and pinned beneath three police officers, showing no signs of life. This recent incident renewed the black, uh, the movement called the Black Lives Matter, and it exploded the internet and gained international attention. Even in our own country, India, story may be different from the blacks and white, but concept and mentality, it is all the same. This pandemic, even in India, it has succeeded in unleashing the racist mentality of Indians when they misbehaved with those from the Northeastern states. Uh, it was on 26 March, a man was arrested for spitting on the face of Manipuri woman and calling her Corona. However, this is not only the time when people from the Northeast faced harassment. Even in an article by Feminism in India, uh, women from the Northeast recall how people calling them by name like Chinky and Momos, and all these are very too common. And then we further accused them of not trying to be a part of the rest of the India. Similarly, uh, there are several such instances where discrimination against people based on color, race, and ethnicity has been seen. We Indians, 
never thought of it as a serious issue. Therefore, I think we should look into our mindset and try bringing changes on an individual level. And the only thing we can contribute to the society, to the nation, and to the world is to protect a newborn baby just because they are human and just because they are alive, not just because they are a good person or a bad person. And I think that's probably the right to life. According to me, uh, we can carry empathy as a weapon to end this discrimination. And in today's world, it is so glad to see the outpouring of the solidarity uh, with people protesting in the streets against racism. And we also got that hope, the hope that as we look back, even in fighting the apartheid system, it took the people of the world to unite and end the apartheid system. And I think the time has come to unite and end this racism because nobody ever in this world has chosen to be black, white, or anything in particular. And in this very special day, I would therefore like to pay respect to the survivors and the relatives of human violation who are with us today. Last but not the least, I think we are not even to be called or addressed as human beings if we ignore the sufferings of others because we all bleed the same color and not forgetting we are all different shades of the same color. And I would like to conclude with a quote by Albert Mammy, laundry is the only thing that should be separated by color. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fiong, uh, for that a uh, very provoking uh, speech and uh, uh, I can uh, re uh, remember something relating to this uh, racist uh, slur when uh, once uh, in Delhi we were called as uh, Madrasi. So this is the way uh, they address the uh, North Indians basically uh, from the central part of India and uh, above it. Uh, they usually look down the uh, southern uh, part of India or the northeastern, uh, they look down. So this uh, this mentality has to go, and I think for this uh, there must be human rights education right from the uh, childhood, and this has to be made part of the school and uh, higher education curriculum also. Uh, so our next speaker miss ningning Newmai, is going to uh, speak on impact of climate change on rights of people and uh, climate change uh, thanks to the industrialization and uneven development uh, we have seen uh, there is a lot of uh, problems and associated with that uh, human rights violations we have seen uh, as a result of global warming there is melting of glaciers. Uh, there is straight to uh, um, islands also. They are going to disappear and even straight to in our own country. There is straight to the disappearance of uh, actually um, Sundarbans. So uh, like this, uh, not only this, uh, this affects people's lives in many ways. So I invite. I would like to invite uh, Miss uh, Ningning to put forward her. Uh, I, her views on uh, impact of uh, climate change on lives of people. Good afternoon once again to all present here. My name is Ningning Niumai and today on this auspicious day, I will be presenting on the topic climate change and human rights violation. The natural environment has provided us with, res with resources which are essential for the survival and flourishment of mankind. However, over the past centuries, selfish human activities have taken a toll on the environment, causing a wicked phenomena like climate change. What is climate change? Climate change refers to the significant changes in the global temperature, precipitation, wind patterns, and other climatic measures over a long period of time. Although it can occur naturally, Studies suggest that changes observed in Earth's climate since the early 20th century are anthropogenic, meaning resulting from human-driven activities. The average global temperature today has increased by 2.09 degrees Fahrenheit. This extreme climatic change is connected to the ever-increasing carbon dioxide levels 
and other greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. The first step in addressing climate change problem was initiated by the UNFCC during its 1992 Earth Summit. Up until recently, people's view on climate change were limited to melting ice and polar bears. We all know how climate change will impact the Earth, but how does it violate human rights? All men are born free with equal dignity and rights. According to the UN, climate change poses one of the greatest threats to human rights of our generation. This includes right to life, water, food, health and sanitation, even right to live in your own country. Some of these rights are the very core of human survival. Now, this is not a mere abstract future possibility. It is already happening. Anthropogenic climate change as the most pervasive threat have begun to have its far-reaching impact in people's life directly and indirectly. This includes sudden onset of events that pose direct threat to human life and safety, as well as gradual onset that will determine access to key life-supporting resources. This impact is evident in the case of rapid melting of glaciers and ice sheets in Greenland. We know that melting ice adds to rising sea levels. In the Arctic region, this is causing vast changes in its ecosystems, which support many indigenous groups living there. Flash floods and rising sea levels are also pushing many island countries like Maldives and Indonesia close to submersion. Likewise, lack of access to clean water in Pakistan has been an issue for quite some time now. In many parts of India, there has been shift in monsoon rains, severe heat waves, and increased frequencies of droughts and floods, destroying many lives. In Nagaland, people have witnessed the longer summers and harsher winters, surge in mosquito breeding, and of course, the frequent landslide. Farmers have also observed a sea change as such. Wet terrace fields have dried up, streams have reduced, and rainfall has become unpredictable. Climate change is also a warning of climate apartheid, a phenomena where the rich can avoid the worst effects of climate change while the poorest suffer. Unabated climate change will cause shortages of food, displacement of people, and mass loss of life. Droughts, famines, floods will only worsen. It will also immensely impact people's standard of living and destroy various essential ecosystems and physical infrastructures. All this will largely impact the poor and vulnerable communities. While these communities may have not contributed to climate change, they will be most drastically affected by it. It is clear that climate change largely prevents people from exercising their human rights, posing enormous threats to the well-being of individuals and communities across the world. Since governments around the world have failed to take immediate preventive actions, prior to the knowledge of climate change and its impediments, we are bound to face certain unavoidable consequences. However, we can still take efficient plans, make efficient plans to mitigate the issues and adapt to it. Thus, the mandate to immediate action to reduce greenhouse emissions and vulnerability and to increase resilience to climate change impact is clear. The manner in which we respond to these challenges can also affect the enjoyment of human rights. Thus, the government obligations are to address the implications and in doing so, to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. To aid the government, there are also human rights mechanisms like the Green Climate Fund, Adaptation Fund, and Clean Development Mechanisms, etc. Individually, we are to make efforts to reduce our carbon footprints by avoiding plastics, reducing consumerism, buying things secondhand, using public transport, etc. A clean, healthy, and functional environment is integral for the enjoyment of human rights. We must all act and work together for each and every person is responsible for everybody's well-being. Thank you.
thank you miss ning ning uh, it's so insightful and each and every one of us has to reflect uh, how we can contribute to uh, protect our environment and also to reduce the carbon uh, emissions so we have to do uh, from our side uh, the best before uh, and we have to keep the theory into practice we are responsible for that as uh, educators and also the uh, educated people right uh, so uh, moving to the next uh, speaker we have uh, mr hotoka he is uh, going to speak on human rights and threat to existence of minorities and we have seen that all over the world uh, we have seen if uh, there is an uh, civil war if there is anarchy uh, or if there is war we have seen the first uh, victims are minorities minorities here uh, it is a very vague uh, topic it doesn't include only the um, uh, based on religion or class caste but also uh, the um, the people with disabilities then women children uh, so on so all are included in that and we know that they are the worst sufferers and now uh in the contemporary world what in many uh places like for example western uh asia west asia if you, if you look at syria there is uh, the children and women are worse sufferers because of the i won't say that um, man are not uh, the sufferers but uh, we see uh, how the uh, religious minorities or the minorities based on language culture uh because language is very much a part of political identity so uh based on this we have seen the case of iraq where ajdis uh how the whole uh, community is erased by the isis so on this basing on this uh, mr hotoka shohei is going to uh, give uh, us insight into what are the human rights uh acts and legislations which are uh, taken by uh, united nations okay so over to ms hotoka thank you ms a very good afternoon and a warm welcome to one and all respected chairperson teachers special invitees coordinators and to all my dear friends and also i'm very glad and thankful to the program committee for giving me this opportunity to speak before you all on this third round table conference on something about human rights related to violation on human rights if you look on it even in today's present scenario efforts by non dominant groups to preserve their culture religious or ethnic differences emerge with the creation of nation state in the 18th and 19th centuries the recognition and protection of minority rights under international law began with the league of nation through the adoption of several minority treaties when the united nation was set up in 1945 to replace the league of nation gradually developed a number of norms procedure and mechanism and so on concerned with minorities the 1966 international convention on civil and political rights and also the 1992 declaration on the rights of person belonging to national or ethnic religion and linguistic minorities recognizes and protects to the person those are belonging to non dominant that is minorities this declaration includes a list of rights to which person belonging to minorities are entitled including the right to enjoy their own culture to profess and practice their own religion and to use their own language it, it also contain measures which state could implement to create an environment conducive to the enjoyment of such right for example through public knowledge of the history tradition language and culture of minorities existing within their territory and enabling person belonging to minorities to participate fully in the economic process and development of their country states are also asked to implement 
national policies and program with due regard for minority interests. The cornerstone of the declaration are the principles of non-discrimination, effective participation and protection and promotion of identities, and also the declaration and inspired by Article 271 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is most widely accepted legally binding provision on minorities in terms of monitoring human rights treaty bodies, as well as special procedure have been paying increasing attention to situation and rights of persons belonging to minorities in practices. However, these rights are far from being realized. The promotion and protection of the rights of minorities require particular attention to be paid to issues such as the recognition of minorities' existence effort to guarantee their rights to non-discrimination and equality. The promotion of multicultural and intercultural education nationally and locally. The promotion of their participation in all aspects of public life too. The inclusion of their concern in development and poverty reduction processes, disparities in social indicators such as employment, health and housing, monitoring around the world are also often the victim of conflicts and internal strife. The situation of refugees and internally displaced persons from minority background, in particular women and children, is of special forces and concerns as well too. Persons belonging to minorities or ethnic religion and linguistic minorities are also often sometimes become a victim of discrimination and they may lack access to among other things, adequate housing, land and property, and even nationality. It was in 2005, the focal point at the United Nations is the independence export on minority issues, which meant that is to promote the implementation of the 1992 declaration. And also in 2007, the forum on minority issues was established to provide a platform for promoting dialect and cooperation in that field, as well as thematic contribution to the work of the independence expert. The United Nations has appealed the principle of self-identification with regard to indigenous people and minorities. And also a particular problem relating to minorities and citizenship is that all too often members of certain groups are denied or deprived of their citizenship because of their national or ethnic, linguistic, characteristic, culture, creed. Anything. This practice is contrary to international law, particularly in regard to Article 9 of the 1961 Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness, which state that a, a contraction state may not deprive any person or group of person of their nationality on racial, ethnic, religious, or political ground. It is thus to note the discrimination against a person on one of the enforcement ground resulting in the arbitrary deprivation of nationality may contribute to meeting some of the requirement in the determination on refugee status. These are some few issues related to rights of minority. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hotoka. And uh, it's good uh, that the statelessness is really a big problem. We have seen uh, the heart rending uh, pictures of the refugees and uh, uh, people who are running away from civil war and wars. Uh, so uh, it is uh, it is very relevant to mention here about the statelessness. And one thing, uh, human rights are uh, for each and every human being, irrespective of their citizenship. That and that that is also an important point we have to notice where we have the fundamental rights in uh, in the democracies we have the fundamental rights except few uh, most of the fundamental rights are only uh, uh, given to the citizens but hu human rights are for each and every human being so our next speaker Mr Botovi Chishi is going to uh, give us an uh, insight on human rights issues in India. And uh, yeah, it's very uh, nice to uh, listen to him because um, India 
we uh, has this history of rights uh, since uh, centuries we can say at least and uh, rights actually uh, during the freedom struggle uh, during uh, i think uh, uh, as part of the purna swaraj then only we have this conception of uh, rights in the modern uh, era and post independent india as part of the constitutional uh, assembly debates also we have the the our four leaders have visioned have they have the vision for having uh, rights political political rights civil rights economic and social rights for each and every uh, citizen of the uh, country and these human rights actually they cover all these uh, political uh, they are part they include all these rights and uh, being the largest uh, surviving democracy in the world and also a uh, society indian society is a plural society let us see how uh, the human rights are the condition of human rights in uh, india so it's uh, over to miss uh, mr sorry mr botuvi uh, you please come forward and uh present thank you miss hello everyone on this glorious occasion i would like to share some of the points i've gathered for the topic human rights issue in india human rights issue in india emerged from the interaction of three kinds of factors first the provision of the international bill of human rights which india has adopted second the provision of the constitution relating to rights of citizens and other similar measures and the third the socio economic condition prevailing in india indian constitution make elaborate provision for the fundamental rights of the citizen these rights are right to equality which includes equality before law and equal protection of law to all persons without any discrimination right to freedom which includes freedom of speech peaceful assembly thought right against exploitation right to freedom of religion educational and cultural rights of minorities and right to constitutional remedies in order to establish socialist pattern of society the right to property was removed from the list of fundamental rights also the right to primary education was included in the fundamental rights in 2002 the directive principle of state policy which contains some non justiciable right to work right to equal pay for equal work right to free legal aid right to adequate living condition etc the implementation of this measure ensures the protection of social and economic rights besides there are numerous specific provision in the constitution to protect the rights and interests of deprived section of society like sc sts obcs women children minority etc besides the above constitutional provision certain other legal and administrative measures are also adopted in india to protect the interests of the weaker section of society some of the major human rights areas of concern in india are number 1 police torture and excess police is the front line agency of the state to maintain law and order the various incident of police torture excess and inhuman treatment are reported regularly from different parts of the country two security force and right violation the deployment of security force with extra power in disturbed area lead to such incident as killing of innocent people or rape of women on illegal detention the 2010 annual report for india by mnst international america reports that in naxal affected area of india 40000 adivasis remain internally displaced and nearly about 20000 living in camps even human rights defender who expose abuses by state force continue to be harassed by the authorities number 3 dalit issues the scheduled caste or dalit constitute lower strata of indian society and they suffer from various disabilities and discrimination like untouchability and various kind of 
harassment and discrimination in the society and public places. Number four, women issue. Women in India are part of weaker section of society and their human rights are violated in many parts of the country. The violation include rape and murder, dowry, torture, and death, discrimination in workplace, violence, female infanticide or fet feticide of a girl, child, etc. Number fifth is minority issue. In India, a large number of minority like the Muslim, Christian, Parsis, extra, etc. are part of society. They face numerous discrimination in society and workplace and access to public services. Their plight is very hard during communal violence. Number six, other human rights include right of children in the form of child labor, prisoners, disabled person, and homeless person, and dwellers of Juki, Jopri, and railway slums. Besides large-scale spread of poverty, the larger population suffer from ill health and lack of adequate means of living condition. Some of the rights issues taken by the National Human Rights Commission in India are Number 1. Abolition of bonded labor 2. Functioning of mental hospitals 3. Right to food 4. Preparing guidelines for media on sexual violence against children 5. Trafficking in women and children 6. Combating sexual harassment of women at workplace 7. Abolition of manual scavenging 8. Dalit issues including atrocities perpetrated to them 9. Problem faced by denotified and nomadic tribes 10. Right of the disabled Right to health and monitoring the relief measure etc. Some of the ma major causes for violation of human rights in India are number 1 is poor implementation of legal provision in social welfare programs relating to right of the weaker sections. 2. Lack of transparency and accountability in administrative system. 3. Discretionary power of the security forces and irresponsible behavior of police forces. 4. Long delay and costly judicial process. 5. Lack of awareness, education, and human rights culture in society. 6. And the last, Lack of poor growth of civil society organization in the field of human rights and political insensitivity among the ruling classes about right issues. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Botovi. It's very nice you have given a wide uh, framework and uh, we can just quickly uh, uh, Remember the past few incidents where we have seen the excesses, uh, state excesses, like uh, we have seen uh, education. Education is uh, for uh, uh, upbringing the ideals of equality from the child stage of childhood, right? But uh, there is an incident where uh, Dalit uh, students and uh, the upper caste students, they were sitting separately and having their midday uh, meals in Balia district of Uttar Pradesh. Then we have the uh, Hatras gang rape victim cremated without knowledge of uh, her family. Uh, it's, so, mm, uh, it's so shameful. We can say that and... Uh, the uh, actually the district magistrate was asked by the uh, 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 by the court that uh, the, uh, where are her human rights and uh, we have seen during this lockdown only we have seen the incident in Tamil Nadu uh, where two father and son were brutally tortured and uh, they were killed uh, by the police so these are the excesses and we have seen uh, people who are fighting for their rights uh, behind the bars and these are excesses of the state. So this is the condition in the country like uh, India. Uh, so I'm very happy that we have a very uh, fruitful discussion. Uh, then we'll move to our next uh, step. We have the special invitees who will put forward their comments and along with their own experiences. So I want to call uh, first uh, retired Major General N. George 
uh, directed Vanguard Business uh, School, Bangalore, to uh, put forth his views. Sir, welcome you, sir. Sir, you are not audible. Maybe some technical problem. Sorry, there are so many technical uh, disturbances uh, in today's program. Yes, sir. We can we can see you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes sir. sir. Loud and clear. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> My apologies, everybody. And uh, good afternoon and great to be back with everybody here. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. Still okay? Yes sir. yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Uh, now, to everybody else, uh, I had been requested particularly to talk about human rights and the Indian Army. Let me start by trying to put issues into perspective, you know, because when you look at it in a limited scope, probably the interpretations will be very different. So what I want to tell you is to look at the issue in two different categories. One is incidents that people get to know about. The second and more important part is to look at the institution of whether it is the Indian Army, whether it is a central government, whether it is a state government or anywhere else. These are two things that you need to factor in when you consider you know, the issues that are happening today. All when it comes to the army or the armed forces, you look at it globally, armed forces, or even if it is governance issue. Let me touch upon governance issues. You can start off with right from, say, the United States that you read most about in terms of you know, Black Lives and today Black Lives Matter, the kind of agitations that are taking place. You can look at what is happening in China in terms of the Uyghur population in the Xinjiang region of uh, China being, uh, you know, literally put 
behind bars because that's the kind of re-education that they are talking about. Similarly, about Tibet, you would have heard a lot. And let us always come down to India. The kind of minority issues that are taking place, these are all areas of great interest to everybody else. Why is it that it persists? Laws and rules and regulations, there is really no dearth of them. We have got all the protection that is there. But again, I bring you to the issue of institutions. So when we talk about minority issues, you have to be able to look at the legislature in terms of formulation of rules, Sorry, and the executive in terms of how we conduct ourselves and the judiciary as to the ability to uphold those laws. I know we can get into this discussion, which will take a long time. I will just leave this as a food for thought before we proceed to the military aspect. See, the entire charter, the declaration of the charter was post-World War II. If you could remember, there were over 6 million Jews and minorities who had actually been gassed and killed. These were major issues that shook the world, and that is how you had this convention come about. But look beyond that today, may not be at the same scale, but there is a lot that continues to happen across the globe. And let me tell you, when it comes to the Indian Army again, particularly in Nagaland, the old timers will be able to quote incidents also. This is where I just want to refer to the Indian Army now. As an institution, the greatest thing that you need to look for in an institution is something called accountability. I don't think there is any other institution in the country that is called to account the way the Indian Army is. So let me tell you that when we have got into the kind of operation, see, first of all, look at it this way. Much of the human rights starts off with, you have already mentioned it, the issue of minorities and religion and things like that. I want to tell you that the Indian Army is an institution which is an absolutely secular institute. Let me quote my example. I have joined the army in a Catholic, but I have joined a regiment that has got nothing to do with you know, a religious identity, that is the Gadwal Rifles. So, the Gadwalis are from the area of Uttarakhand. Entire religious beliefs and adherences are totally different. But in the armed forces, particularly in combat units, you need a certain motivation to motivate people. And that is how I can tell you that I myself, post my joining the army, have actually spent more time in the temple performing, including the rituals that go with all that is required in a temple. More than I have been able to go to a church. It is something that is most normal. So it is not something that is unique to me as an individual, but it applies across the board to the entire Indian Army. So one is an absolutely secular institute that gives you a kind of a base for tolerating and accepting other human beings for what they are and not for what they belong to. Second is the aspect of when people join and the kind of training that you go through. The same aspect is drilled and dwelt in. Your identity from caste, color, creed, none of it is of consequence. Only thing that matters is what you bring to the table in terms of your abilities, your quality. That is what is nurtured and that is what keeps you going because any kind of a deviation is totally unacceptable. 
the last part is what I was telling you about the level of accountability. You know, the armed forces, when you are trained, I would like each one of you to put yourself in the shoes of somebody who is in uniform. And what is being drilled into you is to be able to fight most aggressively. If you go into some of these training areas, you will find those, you know, huge hoardings to say, without mercy, without remorse. I mean, that is what you psychologically build a person to be. But these people are not supposed to be employed within the boundaries of our country. This training, this psychological buildup, all of it is get people to operate in this fashion across your borders. Unfortunately, state institutions not being able to manage the situation, bring the army in, which is an absolutely unavoidable, I mean, which is a totally avoidable issue, but in government find it convenient. And for reasons beyond that, also the armed forces continue to be employed like this. Now, if I if you can appreciate the kind of psychological preparation of a soldier, and now when it comes to being employed locally, it requires great, great, you know, control on people to be able to get them to conduct themselves, dealing with your own people. Again, when it comes to the issue of asking you to understand what people go through, I can tell you in a place like Kashmir, imagine yourself, you are part of a troop, a team that is moving, and you have a massive crowd in front of you who are pelting you with stones. But this entire mob is being led by women. And then, and there are children. And from there, imagine if somebody fires at you. I won't give you an answer for that because, you know, every situation is different. But I'm just trying to tell you that these are the kind of situations that people land up in. Consider another aspect. Imagine that you and your family members are in a situation like this. Why do I mention family members? I want you to remember that every buddy of yours in your unit is as good as family to you. Now, in certain terrible circumstances, when you lose one of your people, there is a response that is almost spontaneous. Then the leadership comes in. How best can I control? How best can I manage the situation? So these are certain live situations that I would like you to appreciate. But I'll come back to what I mentioned. Accountability is never lost out. If there is one institution that follows up on any incident which is not appropriate, I would say that the army is probably right at the top. Some of it may not be known to you. Let me say that me, at a certain leadership level, something has happened in my command. The public may not get to know as to what has happened to me. But you can be sure that your future is affected. Because nobody would want it to be announced to the public, because then you are undermining the rest of the uniform force. And then you can land up in a situation that I do not want to get involved. Why take a chance? Keep away so that nothing goes wrong. Now, that is not acceptable in the armed forces. You want people to do what they are expected to do. But if something goes wrong, you are not spared either. So that's the kind of situation that we are in terms of the armed forces. I know one of you had brought up the issue of uh, literally the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Let me assure you that it is an issue that is bandied about a little too much. Frankly, what it gives you is nothing more than what the police have, other than the fact that I think there is one issue where 
the authority to open fire can be even at the level of the NCO. That is probably one of the distinctions that is, you know, talked about a hell of a lot. Things may have been a little loose earlier on. Today, with the kind of transparency that is there in terms of, you know, the media and the kind of, you know, uh, scrutiny that takes place, a whole lot of all of this has actually become an extremely rare thing. So imagine that if you've got a one million strong army with people deployed right from JNK all the way to the northeast. Imagine today the what is happening in Ladakh, and if you have to think of the number of people who are getting committed there in such a massive force, you can expect that as long as human beings are around, some of these incidents will continue to happen. Important issue, never allow it to pass. You must have to do something to send out a corrective message. Because let me tell you, if in one of those insurgency areas, if anybody has to imagine yourself sitting there in command at the lowest level, if something goes wrong where you have alienated the local population, be sure that you cannot succeed in what you want to do. So no leader, no commander will ever want or look to encourage conduct that is not appropriate. Because you need local support to be able to succeed. That is always at the forefront when you operate on those areas. So like I told you, exceptions will be there as long as humans are taking decisions and doing things. Exceptions will be there. Never allow that to mainstream. This is what I had to talk about as far as the army is concerned. Uh, since Dr. Vijay had asked me to comment on what the students had also spoken, first of all, let me compliment each one of you. Very nicely done in terms of the subject that you have dealt with. I know each of the issues, right, starting from human rights, to race issues, to climate change, to minorities, human rights, all of it beautifully done. I want to leave a message. You know, much of what you have spoken has talked about incidents also. I would like you to take that kind of information and study incidents that are happening clearly within the country and to you to look at Nagaland particularly. Since I have spent time there, I want to tell you that many of these things are staring you in the face on a daily basis. Let me throw one or two pointers. I want to tell you that one of the reasons why I even moved out from there, from the role, from the job that I was doing, was because I know that there were a couple of incidents, specifically two that I quoted when I was leaving, where you had a clash between two of the armed groups, they you call them political groups. And in that shootout, you have one innocent villager who's killed. No accountability. But what hit me the most is you had only that particular district which all of you will relate to in terms of tribal terms, were the ones who got together to say that we will not pay so and so group. What surprised me is that the rest of the state did not seem to react at all. And I'm talking about these incidents that happened right there when I'm going through each of those newspapers. And obviously, when an incident like that happens, I go there and I speak to people. I met people there right from the administration to the police to the governors and everybody. Why is it that the student community does not discuss these things? I mean, these are the, this is the food for thought I would like to leave you. There was reference to climate change, and I think it was Ning Ning who talked about it, about the kind of rainfall pattern and the temperatures and things like that. I would like you to think of the construction work that is taking place. 
whether it is Kohima proper, whether it is along the route to Dimapur, or you look at so many other places. How long can we continue digging into those hillsides and carrying out construction work, which is brick and mortar, cement, and things like that? What is going to happen once the rains come in? Now, these are issues that are within you know, own management. We should be able to talk about it. Why does then the student group not get together and meet up with the administration, we meet up with the government? Take a lead. The world over, whether it is a Malala Yusuf Zai or for climate change, look at the students who are taking the lead. So first, when you get together and talk about issues that are closest to you, when we talk about minorities, many of you will remember, I think it was a couple of years back, one of the Mias, a migrant, I think who was accused of a rape and a murder, was pulled out of jail and strung up and killed. And then it turns out that he was not the culprit. There are so many in-house issues that each one of us can relate to. We need to work in all that you had studied and brought out just now, which was beautiful. Look at how much can we do to make a difference locally. A couple of points to leave you with. At the heart of a whole lot of this understanding is quality education. When we talk about discrimination, when we talk about lack of, lack of opportunity, you know, today in India, we've got used to running around talking about reservations for me, reservations for me, reservations for me. Whether it is caste, creed, tribe, all of it. The only thing that we need to ensure that everybody gets is quality education. If quality education is there, your entire recognition, your appreciation of whatever is going around will be better and you'll be in a position to do something about it. Second point, strengthen institutions. It starts from government, it starts from police, it starts from, it goes down to We've got the enforcement directorate, you've got the CBI, you've got the armed forces, you've got the judiciary. Strengthen institutions, which means people's vote matters. You can make a difference. And last point is to take charge of issues within control. Let's start making a difference from what we can manage. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'll be able to uh, uh, try to answer later. Thank you, sir. Uh, very insightful uh, speech and uh, student speakers. You have to take note of uh, points, uh, sir has advised you. And uh, sir, it is not only for the students to learn, uh, but also the teachers, because uh, teachers are, are the one who guide them and they uh, teachers also have to realize their duties and they have to uh, practice so uh, it's very nice wonderful speech sir uh, thank you now i i would like to invite mr prem visiting faculty of sociology uh, to take the, uh, uh, to take, uh, take over yeah uh, very uh, good evening to all I'm very happy to uh, present in front of you all. And it's also very uh, enlightened to listen to uh, young minds, which uh, they've touched upon various issues and uh, starting from uh, international uh, rights to the minority issues and, and so all, all issues are embedded with the historical narratives. So uh, very uh, like uh, enlightening to listen to your uh, young minds about a very uh, like historical narratives so that's kind of enlightening uh, speech of all the students and uh, and also here i'm going to uh, talk about uh, the comparative understanding of the liberal communitarian debate in the domain of rights discourse especially how it happened in the continental philosophy and in the same way uh, how 
those historical conjunctures, ex especially uh, during 1970s and 1980s, what kind of historical changes which has been happening in the uh, Indian academia as well as in the, the civil rights movement and other kind of uh, social activist groups. So, like uh, my uh, whole, uh, I'm trying to foreground this co comparison. Anyway, just uh, trying to draw certain kind of uh, parallels, be parallel between these two uh, ongoing uh, movements. Though one is happening at the very uh, theoretical realm of uh, continental philosophy, uh, liberal and communitarian debate, and uh, and an another at the level of uh, scholarships and uh, discourses in the Indian uh, academia. See, first uh, the. The first point, uh, it's uh, it's especially in the uh, discussion on justice and uh, rights. All it's been um, traced through the historical uh, understandings of the uh, British intellectual traditions that you you, you all know. It's uh, kind of a J.S. Mill law, and you're all a student of uh, political science, so and also we are all the. Uh, part of the political science team. So we, we know this kind of the liberal arguments and liberal uh, scholarships and how it has been evolved over a period of time. These kind of uh, debates, especially uh, after John Rawls theory of justice and uh, later it has been developed by uh, Charles Taylor, communitarian debate. There is certain kind of uh, these two camps always have different kinds of uh, uh, variations and they they tend to converge at one point and they uh, try to deviate at, at another level it's it's a uh, it's one one is a, at the level of methodological individualism and whereas a communitarian attempt to ground the historical uh, uh, narratives and and so on and also there is a, again uh, there is a lot of crisscross also uh, exist among these uh, two camps it's not like watertight compartment and just if you see this debate which happened in the 1980s context and also uh, on the second uh, level what is happening in the indian uh, context so i like to uh, like extend the argument from a keynote speaker dr p anthony raj uh, he, he, he was talking about especially the the rise of backward caste movement and the, the rise of Dalits in the political sphere and also other uh, issues, minority issues and all, all other identity issues are coming up. So identity uh, trying to, uh, identity politics uh, becoming a kind of uh, forefront in the uh, academy. Academy started looking at uh, identity politics in a much more uh, different lens. So it's, it's not just uh, out of the blue, it's like a movement starts coming from different regions. And also, if you look at the, the rights discourse, uh, especially this, the relationship between the state and citizenship, whereas uh, citizenship is entitled to different forms of uh, resources and the state supposed to uh, safeguard the rights of the citizen, it's been also not only the domain and civil society attempt to take this uh, leap. And also at the another level, uh, the economic uh, uh, policy, the changes in the economic policy, the, pol the political regimes and uh, are trying to uh, move to the market oriented uh, changes like uh, it's, it's, uh, the welfare uh, state and welfare mechanism has completely uh, wiped out from the state's uh, policies and uh, social policies, whereas uh, the relationship between market and uh, civil society governs the most of the cases and whereas a lot of NGOs and international organization start uh, coming into the uh, realm of safeguarding the rights. So this is the trend we could see from 1980s to at present juncture. It's, it's a 30, 30 years we can see 
i'll i'll just stop this comparison and uh, and uh, let me uh, talk about the the, pre the present uh, issues a kind of digital divide a student aishwarya ready committed suicide in uh, lady sri ram college at delhi university because of uh, she she is a kind of recipient of inspire fellowship but government failed to give a fellowship for her and uh, because of her she committed suicide it shows how digital divide it's been kind again reproducing the the effects of uh, social inequality and very uh, embedded and deep uh, psyche inequality so how do we uh, go ahead with it yeah i'll stop here thanks for giving this opportunity and uh, i i really a uh, wonderful opportunity to be part of this team thank you all uh thank you mr prem uh, a very short uh, but uh, very uh, you know it's insightful and you have ended with uh, a, a incident uh, which everyone of us has to uh, think and uh, i think now it's time for question and uh, questions uh, so let us have the question and answer uh, session so those who have questions you please uh, either raise your hand using that option or leave your comments in the chat box yeah uh, here is a question for uh, sir uh, um, george sir uh, it is from mosa naga and it is about human rights is a right simply by virtue of being human having said that you were views in a glance between terrorist and human rights the legality of human rights when terrorist or terrorism is uh, concerned so uh mosa i am mosa i am not too sure if i have understood your question could you just speak to me please am i audible uh, dr vijay sir yes sir you are audible yes um, uh, mosa could you just put that across to me because i am i don't think i've understood the question really yeah he is asking uh, he will okay okay if any more questions please uh, just uh, comment on the chat box and most of my confusion really is are you talking about the rights of a terrorist or are you talking about the rights of the public the rights of terrorist he has um, come in okay if just uh, till till mosa can come across such uh, rights of terrorist okay uh, see 
when you say a right of a terrorist first of all uh, you know you may have heard it said that a terrorist is a terrorist to one side and maybe a freedom fighter for the others so if you talk about say terrorists in kashmir i am not talking about people who come from across the border but people who are within because from outside the border it was initiated instigated and built up and then you have created quite a few who have taken up to arms you talk about uh, you know so many of these uh, taliban and people like that many of them have a lot of support amongst certain sections of society the point i would like to highlight here is this my right for freedom or whatever it is should never have to impede the rights of my neighbor and people around me or the rest of society so there are certain set norms resort to arms as a terrorist does it takes away whatever rights you may have because you are actually impinging on the rights and the livelihood of the rest of society so that is how if you are talking about the rights of a terrorist they frankly do not exist the only thing is whether it is resorting to kill or whether it is taking a person into custody and getting him or her to face a court of law i can give you examples from kashmir where such offers have been made i'm telling you about in a village in a particular hut you have got i think in this particular case there were about four of them who were holed up firing has started but then from the local villagers you get to know that out of the lot that is there three of them were locals and only the guy who was the leader was a guy who had come across from pakistan so we made it a point to get the villagers to put across an offer to them that you come out raise your hands and you come into custody but quite clearly they were not permitted to do it and then you had to go through the operation to complete it so now this is what it is when it comes to the right of a terrorist you can stake claim for like now i think one of you had also talked about you know the displacement in uh, the area the naxal areas again a very delicate issue to be able to permit in terms of black and white one is that my right as a local to continue to survive to sustain myself from the forest the second is that many of those areas have certain mineral resources that the government finds is a necessity to exploit for good of the country as a whole it's a balancing act so there is a need to ensure that people's sustenance is not denied by providing whatever is the means of continuing with you know the lands not being taken away from them but certain areas for mining which some of it is just not i mean it's not avoidable at all so this is a balancing act to put a black and white solution to that is a problem but i will close with what i said in the beginning resorting to arms disrupting life for the rest of the society is unacceptable so that is where your right ends anything that is peaceful provides you all the rights and the opportunities i hope i have answered you more sir He has replied, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question, Mosa. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Uh, you can ask. Even the speakers can also uh, pose questions. Uh, okay, sir. So, uh, uh, can I ask something uh, which is out of the context? Something. Yeah. 
go forward. Uh, okay, so, uh, so, um, so it is about the self defense. For say, like, uh, so, someone is trying to rob me, and you know, and and let's say he is crazy, and uh, uh, he intend to kill me. So, so uh, while I'm trying to defend myself, I uh, I killed him accidentally. So, what will be the penalty for my uh, actions? Uh, to whom is the question? Uh, anyone? <laughs> okay, since nobody else, then let me pretend. Uh, I think this is from Tete, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. Tete, what I'll tell you is that everybody has a right to self-defense. Now, Obviously, in case you have defended yourself and maybe you have killed somebody else, it is natural that you will go into custody and you will face law. But the judiciary always looks at the circumstance under which something has happened. So that is purely a judicial decision where you need to prove that, yes, your life was at stake. Now, again, I can tell you from the experience of the armed forces you cannot afford to wait for somebody to point a gun at you because if you have allowed that to happen you have probably compromised your safety so that may not have happened and you may have probably taken a preemptive action by defending yourself ideally it should not be a shoot to kill. That's what the army follows. You have something called use of minimum force. But suppose you have seen a weapon and you find that there is no other way but to make it, you know, a kill. Now, these are the issues that the judiciary will look at. But basic point, right to self-defense is guaranteed for every human being. Do I answer that, Tete? Yes, sir. Sir, very much clear. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. So, any more questions? Okay. Uh, then I will give chance to Mr. Loshe. Please take over. Um, thank you, Dr. Vijaya, and uh, thank you to the student speakers and the guest speakers as well for your most informative and potent discussion. I'm very sure there are multiple essential key points that we can take away from this discussion. I think we've just about reached the end of the webinar. Um, I'd like to call forward Mr. Kikru Seto for the concluding remarks. Uh, mm, hello, am I? Mm. Good afternoon to each one of you. And all human beings are born equal and free. This statement is so complex. The complexity increased with the challenges faced by an individual in claiming and inheriting rights since birth till death. Today, we celebrate International Human Rights Day as we commemorate the adoption of United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. This session is enriching with a keynote addresses, emphasis on, on evolution, necessity, promotion, and protection of rights. The highlight of the day is students round table discussion who try to address the interference between the international law and international humanitarian law. Impact of global challenges on human rights, both globally and internally. And I'd like to thank all the special invitees who had given their comments to align with their own experiences. And I'd like 
to thank the head of the department and other members in the IT department for their cooperation and support. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Kukrusetu. Um, again, I'd like to thank the IT department and the Department of Political Science for organizing today's webinar, and in particular, our head of department, Dr. Rimi Longmei, and most importantly, Dr. Vijaya. Without her and her ideas, we will not be here together to celebrate International Human Rights Day. So a big thank you to all of them. And I suppose we have reached the end of our webinar. So I wish all of you a very pleasant evening. And um, well, until next time, thank you, everyone.